China benefits an e economically and strategically from the war in Ukraine. China is though far more exposed to the global economy than Russia is or was. And China has a lot to lose if things become stickier there and if there is a far greater economic impact. So I do see that China benefits from the conflict in Ukraine, but it is a balancing act. And I think that it could also equally become damaged by it should things economically, globally become worse. The G7 summit has come to an eventful end today. Joe Biden met with President Zelensky and announced $375 million of military package for Ukraine, including ammunition, artillery, armoured vehicles and training. Now, the support can't come soon enough as Russian mercenaries, the Wagner Group, claim victory over the highly contested eastern city of Bakhmut. President Zelensky told reporters the city is destroyed, but the fight isn't over yet. Mr. President, does Zelensky is Bakhmut still in Ukraine's hands? The Russians say they've taken Bakhmut. I think no. But you have to, to understand that there is nothing. They destroyed everything. There are no buildings. It's a pity, it's tragedy, but for, for today, it, Bakhmut is only in our hearts. There is nothing on this place. So, just ground and a lot of dead Russians. But Russia wasn't the only bogeyman at the summit. Earlier today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak warned China poses an international security threat. The G7 also demonstrated unity of purpose on China. China poses the biggest challenge of our age to global security and prosperity. They are increasingly authoritarian at home and assertive abroad. And as the G7 have showed, the UK's response is completely aligned with our allies. This is all about de-risking, not decoupling. And with the G7, we are taking steps to prevent China from using economic coercion to interfere in the sovereign affairs of others. Joining me now are Tim Ripley, weapons analyst at Jane's and author of Little Green Men, the inside story of Russia's new military power, and Ian Williams, author of Fire of the Dragon, China's new Cold War and former foreign correspondent in Moscow. Welcome to you both. Uh, Tim, Tim, I would like to start with you first. What do you make of Biden's, President Biden's uh, latest military aid following the green light uh, for the fighter jets in particular? Well, the fighter jets is really important. It, it, it's, it takes the military aid to a new level. Uh, the, uh, and as, as of, as of uh, today, no one has supplied modern Western fighter jets to Ukraine. So that's that's a big step up in the in the Western support for the Ukrainians. But the three hundred seventy five million pound package is pretty modest by um, the standard of previous U.S. arms packages, which were measured in billions. So it, it's more a topping up exercise rather than a ramping up exercise. And Tim, uh, we hear a lot, of course, about all the weaponry and the aid going to Ukraine. What do we know about the other side? What do we know about Russian state of affairs and the state of their military at the moment? We saw that the victory parade featuring a solitary tank. Now, a lot of people read a lot into that. Uh, but what do we know about the state of the Russian war machine at the moment? Well, the Russian war machine is, is transitioning into fighting a long war. Their, their aim is to fight a war of attrition. Uh, we saw it uh, this week with uh, almost every day for the past 10 days, the Russians have launched quite big missile strikes and drone strikes on Kiev and other cities to try and uh, run down the Ukrainian air defences to open up their, their air supremacy for their, their manned aircraft. So they are putting their effort into building up uh, the resources to fight this war month on month on month. And uh, the leader of the Wagner Group uh, described the, the, the campaign in, in Bakhmut as Operation Meat Grinder um, and just to try and uh, lock the Ukrainians into this battle of attrition in which uh, they they pit their uh, their armed supplies from the West into whatever the Russians can build in their factories. So it, it is, we're in a, in a pretty much a, a, a fluid state at the moment. Nobody seems to, on either side seems to have dominance on this battlefield, and it's, it's all to play for in the coming months. Um, the Ukrainians have yet to commit their, their reserve force of Western-made tanks and artillery, and the Russians are succeeded in their offensive to capture Bakhmut and uh, inflict losses on the Ukrainians. So 
it's move and counter move over the next couple of months as both sides jostle for advantage in this uh, increasingly bloody war of attrition. Ian, uh, I was wondering whether we can come to China because uh, the G7 meeting was very much a show of support for Ukraine, but uh, the fingers started to get pointed towards China, calling China the biggest uh, factor of instability and insecurity around the globe. How is the G7 messaging going to go down in Beijing? Probably not too well. China is a, a master of contrived indignation and uh, everything is usually everybody else's fault. They see themselves as a victim and no doubt they will come out growling at the G7 ganging up on them. Uh, but of course, this is a direct response of, to, to China's own behavior. And it is an unusual degree of unity on the part of the G7. And I think connected in many ways to uh, the Ukraine, the Ukrainian situation, because I think, yes, China has, is increasingly authoritarian at home, aggressive internationally, but the major industrial countries have grown up as have, uh, their eyes have been open to the, the, the danger of dependency. And of course, we saw that in the case of, of Russia, dependency on hydrocarbons, the economic impact that had on the West. And I think countries now realize that the dependence upon China, uh, an increasingly hostile country, could be far more damaging to their economies than that on Russia. And they need to be aware of that. They need to respond to that. Uh, and that is very much behind the statement that we've seen. And do you think, Ian, that China could be holding the key, perhaps, to the conflict? Uh, uh, in Ukraine. We have not seen China say too much. We've seen uh, China use its influence to sometimes uh, uh, hold President Putin back, if you like, and particularly when there was talk of nuclear threats. It was very clear that China was, uh, was displeased at that kind of language. Does China still have a part to play in that conflict? Potentially, um, I would argue that China is already playing a role in that conflict because they are effectively bankrolling Russia uh, through massively increased trade with Russia, through dual use uh, trade, dual use technology going to Russia. They've, they, they've not yet crossed the line of supplying weapons in any large scale as far as we know, although there have been some accusations of parts reaching the Wagner group of mercenaries and other and others. Certainly China could play a part. Certainly China does have influence with Putin, but the question is whether it really wants to or whether it rather uh, sees a benefit in having the West tied down in, in, in Europe drawing its attention perhaps away from the, the Indo-Pacific, uh, and also, of course, China benefiting enormously uh, as a result of the conflict in their relationship with Russia, because they now become by far the more senior partner uh, in, in that arrangement. So I am rather sceptical about China's willingness to play a constructive role to, 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 to see an end to the conflict. But there's no doubt that if they wanted to, they certainly could influence Putin. In fact, there are a few others that could do so. I mean, in a sense, does it suit China to see the rest of the world, particularly the West, sinking money into Ukraine, being occupied by Ukraine, whilst China can sort of get on with um, its own interests in areas outside that war? Up to a point, I think that is the case because China benefits in ec economically and strategically from the war in Ukraine. China is though far more exposed to the global economy than Russia is or was. And China has a lot to lose if things become stickier there and if there is a far greater economic impact. So I do see that China benefits from the conflict in Ukraine, but it is a balancing act. And I think that it could also equally become damaged by it should things economically, globally become worse. Tim Ripley, as a weapons analyst, two questions for you before we um, wrap it up. Yeah. Firstly, is Russia, and we've heard there from Ian's, from Ian, 
getting help, uh, financial help and financial security from China, does that mean that military and sort of equipment-wise, for Russia, it's a bottomless pit? They don't have to worry about uh, their military power being weakened? Well, well, the the biggest problem for the Russians is paying their people, keeping them motivated to fight, and obviously paying their factories to produce shells and missiles and armoured vehicles. And that obviously the, the displacement of their oil trade from and their gas trade from Europe to China has kept that money flowing, which mm. has been crucial for, for the Russian war effort. So we've seen the uh, Russian military this year um, recruit over 100,000 contract professional soldiers, as well as having their 300,000 300, called up reservists. So that's given them a boost on the battlefield in terms of manpower. And those soldiers have to be paid and they have to be paid quite uh, well uh, quite well paid to keep them motivated to fight. Uh, and so the, the, the Chinese money is, is crucial to that. that, that, that um, right. War machine. And, and Tim, finally, we hear a lot uh, from President Zelensky about this counteroffensive. Now, we talked a little bit about the F-16 jets that are on their way. We now find out about more money, uh, $375 million coming their way. When are we likely to see the start of this counteroffensive? And how successful do you think it's likely to be? Um, I, I think that it's been over-egged a bit. Um, it, it's been sort of billed as sort of some D-Day landing, massive offensive that will turn the course of the war. Um but you have to think in terms of the scale of it. We're talking about 250 tanks that the West has supplied to them and a similar number of armoured vehicles. Um, that's not very many in terms of the scale of this war. We're talking about a thousand kilometre front line. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've 100,000 casualties on both sides, probably. So it's very likely that, that that force will be committed. It will gain a tactical advantage, recapture some terrain, but it's unlikely to to be of a scale and magnitude that will result in a Russian collapse. And that's the only hope they have, that they can cause such casualties and losses that the Russian army cracks and panics and and results in an uprising back home of regime change. 